Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah from the Raleigh Public Library and it's my pleasure to be able to offer this program to you thanks to the generosity of 50 libraries who have signed on to participate. After the author talk portion with the assistance of Mary from Wilmington, um, we will have 30 minutes of moderated Q&A. Please be aware that Mercury will not have time to answer all of your questions. Um, without further ado, allow me to introduce you to our speaker for this evening. Mercury Stardust is a professional home maintenance technician, performer, and award-winning activist. Known widely as the Trans Handy Ma'am, their unique brand of compassion, education in the home repair space has earned her internet fame. With over 2.5 million followers on TikTok and over 750,000 on Instagram, Mercury spreads DIY knowledge with love. With that, please welcome Mercury to our metaphorical stage. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, what a beautiful metaphorical stage. <laughs> Um, I always joke that I am not the trans IT lady, so thank you for bearing with me, everybody. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we are good to go. I'm so sorry. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did you want to talk a little bit about your book? If you have to. oh sure well I'm I was waiting for you to ask me some questions so <laughs> okay <laughs> um we can do we can jump right into questions if you want um let me sure. see what all right okay we have a question um what motivated you to start a platform on TikTok well that's a good place to start um uh, well I started doing TikTok or uh, um, in the back door I did not plan doing it um I was a professional burlesque dancer for. 15 years, um, and COVID really uh, knocked the heck out of us, um, and it was really hard for us to find a place to perform and do the things. So I was really just falling back on what I was good at, and I was fixing things. So I was in property management, and a friend of mine kind of like called me out of retirement and was like, hey, would you want to come back and do uh, an internet show? And I said, nah, I don't know. No, The last time I did it, no one watched it. And they said, ah, you should do an online burlesque show. I think people would. So we did it. And I was right. No one watched it. <laughs> um, and a friend of mine said, hey, uh, I think I have an idea. How about you join TikTok? And I think it's a good place for people to generate an audience. And I laughed. I was like, I am, I, I I don't know anything about anything about IT or uh, video stuff or anything. Uh, so that's not going to work out too well. Well, three weeks later, I had 100,000 followers. <laughs> um, so it started as me just uh, kind of trying to just help one person at a time. There was really... You know, it was for the burlesque show, right? But it wasn't really, the burlesque show was always about community and always about like bringing people together. And it was a really trans driven show. We did it for five years. It's the same show I came out as. Like I came out as a trans woman on that stage in front of a whopping eight people. <laughs> and it was a, a really important part of my life. So when I got to show the world one step at a time, um, kind of more um, of my life, that was a huge opportunity. All right. We have another one here. Um, what are some warning signs when you're looking for a house to tell you to avoid buying it? I, I That's ironic because I just moved into my house like two days ago. So this is my house. So it's a little bit echoey. I'm a little bit sweaty uh, <laughs> uh, and all that jazz because I've been doing all this work. I literally pulled up the carpet today in the house. Um, but there are a bunch of things that look out for. Um, you know, if you're in the state of Wisconsin or any type of Midwestern state, if you look on the side of the house and you have shingles and you have three or more layers of shingles, um, well, you might have a lot of weight on that roof. You know, there's things like that. When you go to uh, the basement and if you have horizontal cracks in a wall, not vertical cracks, uh, you may have some problems with the foundation that you may uh, desperately want to look into. Um, there's a laundry list of things. You know, I I would say sometimes it's best to to look for the basics. And I think the basics are 
when we are looking for a home, we want to look around the house. And we mean the foundation of it. So when you're looking outside of the house, you want good slopage. You want the water to run down. You don't want it to pool around the house because that's how you um, have erosion. And that's how you have a lot of problems with the foundational leaking. Um, so that's a huge one. If you can avoid that, if you can get a, a house with a decent foundation, you're in a better spot, right? If you ever go to the basement or a kitchen of an older house in the 50s or 60s or 70s, and you see nine by nine tile, chances are that has asbestos in it. Um, and that comes with a whole laundry list of things. We have asbestos in this house, and I bought the house specifically because it had asbestos, so I could show you how to remove it. <laughs> uh, and all that jazz. So that's where we're at. And those are the big key things. I, I would say um, right now in the housing market, if you're looking, I would say be patient. Uh, don't rush anything. And so many people are going to tell you to waive a home inspection. And if you're not someone who has, you know, my knowledge or my skill, I wouldn't ever do that. We did, but I'm in a very specific, different uh, situation than others. All right. I am up next with a question. So this the next one says, hi, Mercury. I've loved following you online and I'm so grateful for the guidance you give online and in your book. Thank you for empowering so many folks. What are your favorite and least favorite parts of having a public platform? I hate that I can't be private. Um, I hate it. I think one of the, I, I you know what's iron the iron the irony of all of this is that I'm really not a a public person. Um, I've always been very private with my life. Um, but I've been trying. I've tried over the years to be vulnerable. Um, and use that for my advantage, right? The more vulnerable, the more people might respect my boundaries. But that kind of the opposite has happened. Um, my audience is beautiful and wonderful, but my audience also uh, is a lot of people who need extra support and love. And if I set a boundary and they think it's too firm, sometimes my audience reacts pretty negatively to that. Um, recently, uh, we moved into this beautiful house um, and I, multiple fans posted where I lived um, because they were excited that I was moving in uh, to their neighborhood. And I wish we lived in a world where we could be excited and share that with the world and not worried about it. But no matter how we twist and turn it, I'm still a trans woman in the world uh, and I'm also a public figure. So my safety and my privacy and it gets stripped from me sometimes, you know, I'll be uh, I've some multiple times I'll be going to the bathroom or going to the bathroom at a public place or airport and people will recognize me and say, oh, my God, it's a trans handyman while I'm in the woman's bathroom. And that's scary for me if I'm in Texas or I'm in Oklahoma, you know, um, I don't. I don't talk when I'm in bathrooms for because my voice and because I'm worried to make people uncomfortable because they might not know I'm a trans person in that space. Um, but I'm also, uh, I don't want to be put in that position. So I don't know. It's it, the private, the lack of privacy is, is the one thing I wish I could have while also having the ability to educate so many people. Thank you for that. Our next one says, do you have any advice for young LGBTQ people who want to pursue media? Oh, wow. That's a, that, that one is, uh, that one's hard because it changed, changes all the time. You know, what, what it was 12 years ago is dramatically different than what it is right now. It's ever evolving. Our, the, our landscape of media is so fast now. And I think that if, first of all, if you're, a trans kid who's a minor, I, I definitely would avoid the internet. Allow yourself to experience the world before you pursue media. Um, if you are someone who's a, a younger adult, 18, 19, 20 years old, you know what, do what, do what is right for you. But I will say this, um, it's hard to share things with the world if you haven't uh, shared enough with yourself first. And I think it's really hard to have something worth talking about 
if you haven't had the ability to live um, a life on your own terms, I think. When I was younger, I tried so hard to be in media. I had a old YouTube channel uh, from the late 2000s and I did this and I did that, you know, and none of it worked and it was all awful. And I look back at it and my eyes roll way in the back of my head um, when I watch it. But a lot of it had to do with the fact that I didn't have anything to say. I was hiding myself. I was, I didn't want to be perceived by people by the way that I actually was. I was hiding my identity from people. So I think that it was hard for me to have a voice without forming that voice. So if you have a strong voice and you are comfortable with your life and you can do it on your terms, then I say go for it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. What is one thing you feel every person should know how to do or fix around their home? Oh boy. This is going to be different for everybody. This is such a hard one to answer. I get asked this a lot. I would say that, you know what? The door hinge is a good one. The door hinge is a classic one because I think there's problems in our homes that when they occur, we let it keep happening. You know, like, oh, that door hinge is falling off or that door knob is falling off. And we just kind of like let it happen over and over and over again. And we don't actually address the problem because we don't, for whatever reason, we just don't. But it's om- it's better to give it a try and fail than it is to just let it keep happening. If you have a door hinge that's loose and the screw hole is all loosey-goosey and you could just shake it all about uh, <laughs> like the hokey pokey, <laughs> then what you could do is take that screw out and you can you you can fill it with a doll or toothpicks or a golf tee and rub that in some wood glue. So now what you're doing is that wood is going to bind to the wood inside those holes in the door frame. And then you can snip the tip and then <laughs> every time I say that, uh, and then you can put the hinge back and then drill the screw right back into it once it dries like 20, 30 minutes. And that's it. That's it. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And you will impress every single person in your life with that one. Um, Also finding a stud. Uh, I think finding a stud is one of those that, um, you know, everyone struggles with a a stud finder. Uh, One of the most common things I get asked uh, is a stud finder because people don't realize that stud finders, there's two different kinds. There are ones that go for hard edges. And there's ones that will find magnets, like find metal in the wall. And the ones that people use and get confused by and they miss the stud are the ones that find the hard edges. Because what they're doing is they find one side of the stud and then the other side of the stud. And sometimes people don't know they have to find both sides of the stud and then get the middle. So then they're just going off the wrong side and they're putting it into just the drywall instead of the drywall, uh, instead of the stud itself. But that magnet, especially a a good strong one, is going to find the screw that goes through the drywall that's going in the stud. And that's a great little trick to blow your friend's minds. And you'd be like, the trans handyman on top of that. Thank you. We have one that says, hi, Mercury. Congrats on your new house. I really like that you include the reminder you are worth the time it takes to learn a new skill at the end of your videos. What motivated you to start including this? That was that was just an accident. I was uh, I was <laughs> I believe I was in an apartment building, an empty apartment building uh, in, in a room. I was doing a turnover. And I would often film my how-to videos when I was first starting, like while I was on break, you know, like I would be like, oh God, I got a 15 minute break. Well, I'm going to go film this, you know? And I think I was, I filmed the how-to earlier that day and I was on my second break and I was sitting down, I was re-watching it, this video. I don't remember what video, well, what first video it was, but I know it was a video that no one watched. <laughs> It wasn't a particularly successful video that I debuted this revelation, you know, to. But I was re-watching the video and I was like trying to find a way to end it. 
And I watched the video and I was like, you know, it's missing something. And I said, man, this is a, a skill that's genuinely hard. And I could see someone not wanting to pursue this because they might think it's hard. And then I was like, well, you know, you're working time it takes to learn a new skill. And it was never heard that before. It was like, it just right in my head. And I don't know, it became a part of it. And then I started saying it more often. And whenever I said it, no matter how many people watched the video, it will always get a reaction. And then I was like, oh, I think I found something. And the same thing happened with the trans handyman. I was originally the intersection, <laughs> but I saved my original uh, title. It's so long and ridiculous, but I used to call myself the intersectional trans maintenance, the intersectional feminist trans maintenance lady. <laughs> I mean, it, it, back in the day, TikTok would only let you do 59 seconds. It would take me 22 seconds to introduce myself. <laughs> A third of every video was high, you know? Uh, so an audience member said, hey, you should call yourself the, the, the handyman. And then someone else underneath that said, you should call yourself the trans handyman. And I was like, I don't know if I like that. And then I was like, I like that. <laughs> uh, and then I, I used it and I it just kept going and growing. A lot of my best ideas came from my audience. Uh, I think that um, there's a symbiotic relationship that content creators can have with their audience. You know that old thing that people will say, don't read the comment section? That doesn't make sense because if you don't read the comment section, you don't connect with your audience. And it's really hard to exclude the negative from the positive. So sometimes you get the negative while also trying to connect with the audience, which is the positive. And it's hard to separate the two. You know, people will be like, you need to have someone moderate your comments. But whenever I done that, I felt so removed from the audience that built me. And I felt so removed from humans. And at the end of the day, this is all about making human connections and about helping people. That's what it's always been about. So if you don't read the comment section, you don't get that. And if you don't read the comment section, you don't find out what people are engaging with. Maybe it's my nails. These are really cute, by the way. Maybe it's my hair. Maybe it's my makeup of the day. All those things are really important. And that's how I started that phrase. You work the time it takes to learn the skill because I read the comment section. Okay. Thank you for that. Also, before I move to the next question, I just have to say your laugh is so infectious and it's incredible. And we've actually had a couple qu like questions and comments about how amazing your laugh is. And I just needed to throw that out there that it is catchy. Um, every time you laugh, I've been laughing behind the scenes. Um, okay. Next question. Will you be writing any more books now that you are a new homeowner? Yeah. Um, so I, this is probably going to be my life. I we, We've talked about this a lot as a company, uh, Mercury Stardust Media, which is me and three of staff members. And we've talked about how um, I really don't plan on being a TikToker. I don't plan on that at all. I plan on being an author um, and an educator online. So we're going to continue to share my story online and share my story in ways that people have always been accustomed to. But the next book is going to be called Our Turn, The First Year of Homeownership. Um, and the first book was very much like trying to like meet people where they're at in a way that they felt the most comfortable. So maybe that's like a children books form a formula. Like if you read my first book, you would see that it was very like, you know, the hungry, hungry garbage disposal, right? Like there's these almost nods to children's books and Dr. Seuss books. And, you know, so the next book is actually going to be just a little bit more of a matured version of that. And it's going to be more of a graphic novel because where so many people who are homeowners, um, where so many people who are renters, need someone to hug them and say, hey, you can actually do this. Where I think a lot of people who are homeowners actually need someone to be like, hey, you can actually have fun and do this. You know, so I think that it's a little bit of a different audience. And I think it's a little bit of a different way to communicate with them. And because it's the first time that I'm actually owning my home, there's a lot of firsthand accounts. So we're going to treat it like part diary. So you'll have all the how-tos, like the first book, but you'll add excerpts from like my experience, like 
you know, when I met with the asbestos removers and when I met with this contractor or um, why I did this first instead of doing the roof, you know what I mean? And I think that having those firsthand accounts will just reinforce that even someone who has all my experience, all my support and all my certifications is still learning in real time with you. And I think that can help support. And then the third book is a book that we've been working on for a very long time from the very start of the trans handyman stuff. And that is an emergency book. And what I mean by that is it's been my like dream the last like five years to have a book where if something goes wrong, say you have your pipes are frozen or your um you know you, you had a short in your oven or something that's like emergency and you're in that panic mode or you're in that recovery mode and you that it can be such an overwhelming thing. What do we all do in those moments? We Google it, right? But I think we need something a little bit more substantial and that can be something that transcends just me being trans. I think we need, like, not just for the queer community, not just for the trans community, not for homeowners, not for renters, but for everybody. And I think it needs to be a book that you can just flip to that has little tabs on it. Like, this is what happens when you, what, how you recover from a fire. This is how you recover from massive flood damage. This is how you recover from a tornado. And I think having those things um, would be very beneficial. And I would love to read that book. That sounds amazing. I'm sure plenty of your libraries will be carrying that once it's out. Our next <laughs> question asks, what's your favorite maintenance thing to do? Clogs. Everyone always gets so grossed up by that one, but clogs. I love fishing. <laughs> I never went fishing in a day in my life, but I love clocks for some reason. Um, it's kind of, you know what I think it is? It's like pulling something out is so difficult. And it is genuinely like you don't know what's down there. You have no idea, but you know it's doing something. And it's so satisfying to see all this water in a tub or a, or a sink. And it's just all the way full up. And then you just take a little snake and you're just like and you get it out that's just the coolest thing in the world i love those when i see a clog i like my heels click <laughs> my imaginary tail just waves <laughs> all right we have one about toolboxes so i just lost it what essentials are in your toolbox um well it is an, it's, it's an, a growing thing but, um it always evolves it depends on what kind of projects we're doing i would say that there are four tools that i've said over and over and over again that everyone should start with and you know a lot of times people will, will say you want to buy a toolkit and i i don't agree with that toolkits will leave out something called an adjustable groove joint pliers uh, or channel locks a lot of us call it and these things are one of the most underrated tools you will ever see, especially the ones, not that just the regular pliers, but the ones that have the groove on it, because you can use this for plumbing. Um, if you put a little paper towel in there, these grooves aren't gonna damage anything if you do that. So shower head, um, turning, uh, fixing your toilet, fixing your faucets, uh, just a laundry list of things. And then on top of that, pulling staples, when you're doing stuff like pulling carpet, uh, ripping carpet up, I can grab carpet and use this to grip it up. Peel, peeling off shingles on your roof. Um, holding um, a screw from behind when you're trying to get it out so you can put pressure on it to actually get it out. This is just one of the most handy tools you'll ever have. And it's never in a toolkit. These are almost never in a toolkit. Um, but if you don't have one of these, I think you're missing out in maintenance. You know, if we're doing, if you're if you're trying to decorate, you're going to have a different set, set of tools. You're going to have your torpedo level. You're going to have your hammer. You're going to have your tape measure. I don't need any of those things to do maintenance. So when we're doing maintenance, we need um, your adjustable groove drum pliers. We need our handy dandy multi screwdriver, at least your 10 in one. The fact that I have all these tools next to me is just saying exactly how important they are. Uh, then you need a utility knife. And then the last one will be an Allen key set. Uh, but these two are the most important. 
you can do so much just with these two. Um, and then a utility knife and the island key will just get you out of trouble. And then when you're trying to build your toolkit and you're trying to grow a little bit, that's when you can add your drill. That's when you can add your, your hammer and, you know, your, your tape measure and stuff like that. But yeah, that's the best answer. <laughs> Okay, let's see. We have a question about what's a renovation project in your new home that you're not super confident about tackling? I kind of alluded to it, um, but I would say probably to assess this removal. I'm not going to do it myself, but I've had three contractors here now, and I've just moved in on Tuesday. So we've had a lot of contractors already here, um, people just coming and going. We have a home inspector to come on Monday. I have a roof contractor coming on Tuesday. I have security um, personnel coming next week to do more work. So we, we have just a lot going on all the time right now. But that being said, I express this as such a, a bubble of wax. It just has such many fallouts that could go wrong. Um, and because I promised my spouse I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I, found, I, I promised DZ that I wouldn't take it out myself. Um, so asbestos is the obvious one. Number two might be the roof. I've done roofing before, but it's such a daunting task to strip off three layers of shingles and then lay on 1,700 square feet of shingles in a probably two or three day period. And it's just grueling work. I often tell people that roofing is not um, difficult. It's hard. And some of these projects aren't typically not really difficult. You could, you could do the work if you pay attention and you follow the, the step-by-step stuff. But it's really hard on the body and really hard on the mind sometimes. And that's kind of what roofing is. So that might be number two or number one. Awesome. Okay. So next question. Did you like fixing things as a kid too? And what's one of the first things you ever tr fixed or tried to fix as a kid or a teen and did it work? My dad forced me to do that. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. But my dad wanted me to be like the spitting image of, of him, you know, but shorter. And, <laughs> and I... Uh, I just hated it so much. I had such a reverse action. But my dad, for the longest time, I mean, until I was like nine or 10, my dad would just, if I was the last boy out of the family, I had two brothers. If I was the last kid left around to do something, my dad would be like, I'll wait for one of the other boys doing it because they viewed me as not good at this stuff, you know? Uh, and my dad would definitely have a lot of, you know, negative things to say. But when I was like 10 or 11 years old, uh, we were doing a project where we were doing Christmas decorations. And my dad um, decided that he wanted to, you know, do a certain thing and decorate it a certain way. And I sat out there for the long time. Oh, yeah, it was after 9-11. Actually, this was 2001, um, freshly off of 9-11. My dad wanted to put an American flag in, in, in Christmas lights in the front yard. And my dad didn't know how to do it. And I, I asked my dad if I could just run with it. And I did. And I just got a whole bunch of different Christmas lights. And I wired in a certain way. And I took the Christmas lights apart and I rewired them. And then, and then I did all the, the pounding of the fence line myself. And I wrapped all the Christmas lights around the fence line. And my dad was shocked that I knew how to do the wiring, but also that I knew how to do all the fencing. And my dad was like, I, how'd you, how'd you know this? And I said, well, I know how to do it. I just don't like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and my dad, for the longest time, we tell that story to friends and we would always talk about how, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they just, they, they just see they just see the, the the world differently and that's how they fix things they just see things differently and I didn't know what that meant until I got older and I realized that because I'm a trans person I've always been trans even if I didn't know it 
my, the world didn't treat me like I was a cisgender man. I was always, you know, being treated like I was too feminine or too this or too that or too weak or too dumb because they perceived my femininity as a weakness. So I was never fully accepted as a man, right? So for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why. I was like, I just view the world differently, I guess. No, I mean, I operate through the world differently. So I'm going to have different perspectives and different ideas. And I might come at things in a more creative way, in a more a different kind of way. And that's a great way to problem solve. You know, we, we too much we look at, some jobs that this is a feminine job and this is a masculine job, but that doesn't make sense. You know, that's just not how things get done, you know? Um, so yeah, that's how my love of it happened. It happened um, by accident. Um, and because I was forced to learn those things as a kid that when I dropped out of college, I didn't have a place to, to go or anything to really any prospects, but I could fix a drain. I could do drywall. And I picked up a job because of that. Awesome. Um, we have a question on a little more serious note. How do you feel about traveling to the States with anti-trans laws? And how do you push through that fear so that you still go to those States? Well, there's people who live there who are trans. I, I, I say this all the time because in every single one of these States that we talk so negatively about, you know, there's trans kids who live there. And if the trans kids have to live there, then we have to show up. And I think it's really important. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with Chapel Room, but I bring up Chapel Room because she's just this iconic figure that's just blowing up in our little, you know, queer universe right now. Um, and really reminiscent of like Gaga 15 years ago. But uh, something I think is really interesting is the conversation that developed around Chapel Roan doing shows in the South. And some people were really upset about her doing shows in the South. Like, how dare you do a show in the South? You should be boycotting the South. That's such a backwards way to think about it. Because it's important for people in the South. It's important for people in spaces where they don't know how to be themselves to be themselves. I went to Lowell, Michigan. If you're like, where's Lowell, Michigan? Exactly. <laughs> Lowell, Michigan was a town of like 2,000 people, uh, I think. And it was um, like, I went there because there's this a cute little bookshop called um, um, Betty's Pages. Uh, and I thought it was just a cute little name. So I showed up and everyone was like, why are you going there? And I went there because I knew that the people who would go there would be people who would never wear a dress or dress outside of what their gender expression usually is, right? Like, it can be hard to explore yourself in public and to be yourself and to feel safe. And I knew if I went to a rural area like that, people who never had that opportunity would have that opportunity. And that's what happened. We had like 260 people, 280 people come out. And the amount of people who drove four to five hours away all over that state just to meet me in Lowell, Michigan was wild, was absolutely wild. It was in a church, too, which made it even funnier. Um, but we did that. We did one of the best book signings we ever had was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had about 400 people show up for that one. And we had people driving seven hours away from that one. We had a great one in uh dallas texas um we had about 250 people for that one we had an amazing one uh in mississippi uh and that one was the bookshop was run by this amazing extraordinary person who was um uh he taught at old miss and they were like the gender studies professor at old miss but as a hobby uh, they ran this little shop, this little nonprofit uh, um, book, bookstore of some kind. And it could only fit like 10 people at a time. It's so, it was, it was like literally a broom closet. <laughs> and it was like the only queer owned bookstore in all of Mississippi. And we went there and we had, it was just so many people who came out to Mississippi. In Mississippi, like only 2 million people live in Mississippi. Like, it's such a beautiful 
place to to be. So I guess the way that I can answer that question is if people are willing to come out, I'm going to be willing to go there. And I feel like I very I have a very strong feeling about that and also about queer identities throughout the entire world. You know, there's a great organization called SafeBo and SafeBo's uh, organization that tries to help queer people escape war zones um, or active genocides like Palestine, right? They also are trying to get people out of Ukraine and are trying to get people out of Uganda. And it's important to remember that queer people are everywhere. And when we talk about these spaces, we need to be mindful that we're like, oh, I don't want to go there because, oh, I'm so scared there. But how do you think that makes someone feel if they're actually living there? You know, it compounds. It can feel like a big punch in the stomach. On the topic of supporting people, we have a question about the Point of Pride fundraiser, if you're planning to do it again and planning to make it a yearly thing. Yep. Oh, well, it's been a yearly thing. This is the third year we've, this was the third year we've done it. In three years, we've done $4 million. Um, we will always keep doing it. Um, as long as I'm, you know, alive and kicking, there'll be a point of pride fundraiser every single year. Gender for Main Care won't ever stop. Um, there will always be more and more people who need it. And my goal is to make that a very large fundraiser. We can raise millions of dollars every year. This year we're going for four million and we came short, but two million is still a massive amount of number. Um, and we did two million last year as well. So, and a lot of nonprofit organizations would die for, for that amount of money. So we're grateful for that, but I do hope that it will continue to grow and be able to generate even more support um, year in and year out. Awesome. Um, okay. We have kind of following that trend with everything going on in the world. How do you stay so positive and upbeat who or what inspires you to get up and face the world every day? Well, um, first and foremost, I'm not positive and upbeat. I'm a very, very, I know that's perception of me, but the reality of me is I'm a very critical person. Um, my spouse and I joke that I'm the most pessimistic optimist I've ever met um, because I I very much will be like, man, what's the fucking point? You know, like I'll have a really negative attitude. And then I'm like, well, if I don't do it, who's going to? You know what I mean? <laughs> like my, my attitude is so like, might as well do it anyways. You know, I always joke that I operate out of spite. And that really is true. Um, I My fuel is spite. If there's a teacher we made this year for the fundraiser that said, um, you're, you're vastly underestimating how much I run in spite. And that's so real. That's so real for so many trans people. So I guess I can answer this in two ways. A, I do not think I'm that optimistic of that positive. B, I choose my happiness. I choose the things I focus on that bring me joy. And I choose the support and love of others. And th those things keep me going. The community that I've built over the last several years, um, that keeps me going. You know, I would not do this if it wasn't for the Point of Pride fundraiser. The Point of Pride fundraiser gives me fuel to want to keep making content every day because the more audience I make when I do my how-to stuff, the more money I can raise for other trans people to access gender from care. All right. Um, we have a question that says, do you have any advice for navigating home ownership or renting as a person with disabilities? How can we ensure our safety and that our unique needs are met? That's a really good question. I think that um, when there's always these government grants that can help us to try to make homes fit our needs um, but as I just did a video the other day uh, about people you know, trying to make their home more accessible in reality, not making their home accessible at all. And I think there's always this thin line that people walk where they want their home to aesthetically look prettier, but they are actually actively making it harder for people to get into the house. I'm actually looking at houses right now that are my neighbors that have no at way to get into their homes that aren't that, that aren't stairs. Um, you know, the, the place I'm in right now, 
ZZ and I are going to have to build a ramp into it because ZZ, my 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 spouse, has mobility problems. They have EDS, um, which is Elder's Dangerous Syndrome, and ZZ some days needs to be in a wheelchair or be or her have their cane or their walker, and it's really hard for us to have. Uh, you know, a basement. The basement is my sanctuary. It's where my tool stuff is going to be. Is where I can go and be loud. But it's also a hard space for Ziza to get into. Um, so trying to find ways to be accommodating for them and to to meet their things. You know, for a lot of us, it's not necessarily like, wouldn't that be nice? It's a necessity. And I think that's, that's, a, that's different for every single person with a disability. I have a disability. I'm deaf in my left ear. Um, I never talk about it publicly because I don't feel like um, I can be the best advocate for people with disabilities because I still have, I still, I still can, can hear um, effectively my other ear. So like my proximity is very different than a lot of people with disabilities. So it's different for every single person. Um, and someone's, support for their home and the way that they make their home work for them might not work for someone else with another disability. All right. Um, I think we have time for, I'll ask one more and then Sarah will ask one more. So how do you keep from getting overwhelmed when your home repair to-do list feels a mile long? Um, one step in front of the other, um, because even when you're walking somewhere, you're gonna get somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, I always tell people that when you're staring at this ginormous list, it's really important to go room by room um, and day by day. So like right here, we have this humongous project, you know, but I'm not gonna start almost anything else until this entire floor is stripped from old staples. And that it's in a positive place, right? Um, that helps to keep me from overwhelming. Now I know there's 101 things in the kitchen and there's 2,000 things in the living uh, in, the, in the bedroom and all that stuff, and that's still there. But I'm going to get the room to be functional, and then I'm going to move to the next, and then I'm going to get that room to functional. Once they're all functional, then I'm going to get this room to look the way I want it to, and then I'm going to move on again, and then I'm going to make this room um, not just functional, but I'm going to make this room like I'm going to expand upon it. I'm going to add, you know, a three seasons porch or something like that. Um, I'm going to add a catio at some point for my cats. So, yeah. Love that. Our cat would be very jealous. Um, okay. We'll wrap it up with this one. I have a question that says, what advice would you have for a non-binary kiddo who's in the middle of dealing with some drama of middle school? If you're going through it right now, I want you to remember that this is a moment in time, that this moment right now, when it's when the pages are flipped, will be something that you won't even remember. I remember the moments of when I was 14 or 15 and and I was going through relationships that I thought was so important to me. And I thought that were the end of the world when I wasn't, when things didn't work out the way I wanted them to. But now the pages have flipped 20 years later and I can't remember some of their names. I can't remember the situations. I can remember the feeling of being hurt. I can remember the feeling of being disappointed, but I don't remember the actual experience itself. And I think that says a lot. I think that it will stay with you, but it won't end you. It, ne it won't have to at all. That if we just put one foot in front of another, we're going to get somewhere. And I just think, keep in mind that it's just a moment in time. Okay, sorry. Um, looks like we have like a couple minutes. So we have a question that asks, um, what is the your favorite color that you've ever dyed your hair? Um, blue. I I'm working back to get it to blue. The the blue the purple base with the blue hair is my favorite. All right. Hey, I actually also had one other quick one. Someone had asked what your tattoo was on your arm, and I figured, well, we have a minute. You can 
So which one? I got two on my arms. I actually got. They were nondescript, so I guess show them all. Okay. Well, geez. <laughs> the ones okay. on your arms. Okay. So this is um a pinup. Um, I you know burlesque dancer. I was a a pinup model and uh and something in my early twenties. So pinups are really important to me. Uh, this is the very first influencer ever. Her name was uh, Princess um, Princess Leela. And Princess Leela was a cat from the 1880s. Uh, she was the very first cat ever photographed. And her images became huge. So she was the very first, like, influencer. <laughs> That's what I always tell people. <laughs> um, and then Winnie the Pooh. This is actually Edward Bearer. So Edward Bearer is what Winnie the Pooh was originally named. At, uh, named. Um, and I really love that vintage Pooh and that vintage Piglet. Um, my nickname um, that my, my spouse gave me is Pooh Bear. And my spouse's nickname that their late father gave them was Piglet. So I always tell um, uh, Zizi that they're my Piglet to my Pooh and I want to get carried away with you. Um, so yeah. And then, um, uh, foxes. I'm obsessed with foxes. Foxes are my favorite animal. Um, uh, and I think I'm showing this up. I don't know if I am. Uh, it's really hard to do, but foxes are my favorite animal. And I had a friend who, um, works at Red, uh, Red Clover, which is a indigenous owned, uh, tattoo collective here in tropical Madison, Wisconsin. And, they we were doing trades i did some work for them and they wanted to do work for me and they decided to, to give me a free tattoo which is so expensive this tattoo would have been so expensive otherwise it was like four sessions all right well i think we are running out of time so i'm going to wrap it up here i just want to give a big shout out thank you so much for being here with all of us um we enjoyed listening to all of your stories and i'm sure that Anyone who's not already following you will hopefully uh, toss you a follow now. Um, and as a reminder, many of you can pick up Mercury's book in your library. So please feel free to check that out there. Yes, we have ours on the Wilmington Pride display right now. I was just looking at it today. So if you're a Wilmington resident, it's on our Pride display. It's very good. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.